Welcome. Um, my name is Daryl Baldwin. I'm the executive director of the Miamia Center here at Miami University, and I'm really happy to see everybody here tonight. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge our tribal leaders that are here on campus. Um, we have Chief uh, Doug Langford down here in front. Yeah. <clears throat> And we have a, a couple of others that aren't here, but I'm going to go ahead and name them. They're, they are on campus. Second Chief Dustin Olds. Uh, present is Secretary Treasurer uh, Donya Williams. <clears throat> and our first council person, uh, Tara Hatley, who's uh, running a little bit behind. So we've had a busy week, uh, but it's been really, really great uh, celebrating 50 years of this relationship. So. Um, well, first of all, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, this afternoon, Dr. Cameron Shriver. <clears throat> Those of you uh, who attended the Celebrating Miami event on Wednesday are already aware of this, uh, but for those of you that weren't in attendance, Cam has deep family connections uh, to the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. His grandfather, former Miami University president, Dr. Phil Shriver, was central to the establishment of the relationship between the Miami tribe and Miami University. And that's what we're celebrating uh, this week. I was first introduced to Dr. Shriver by email many years ago while he was an undergraduate student uh, working on, on a research project uh, concerning my fifth great grandfather, Epikonita, or uh, William Wells. I remember being struck by Dr. Shriver's interest in Wells as a white captive who grew up to adulthood living in a Miamia village and how notions of his identity were blurred in this context. After he completed his undergraduate degree at William and Mary, Cam decided to return to Ohio and pursue a PhD at Ohio State in early American history. From the very beginning of his graduate work, Cam strove to be an engaged scholar. He freely shared his research with the Miamia Center staff and took he took interest, questions, and responses uh, of the Miamia people seriously within his work and research. Throughout his graduate work, he impressed us all with his historical knowledge, research skills, and humility. Cam continues to deepen his knowledge and advance his skills as a historian, but his work is, has, is always undertaken in the spirit of advancing our collective understanding of the past rather than cementing his status as an individual authority of Miamia history. After graduating with his PhD in history in 2016, the Miamia Center hired Cam to begin the first stages of researching the legal legacy of the reserves and reservations created by the treaties prior to the forced removal of the tribe west of the Mississippi. This work has evolved and expanded into a complex interdisciplinary project called Alchimwakion Gonje, Stories from the Land. The goals of this web-based resource is to revitalize Miamia connections to our homelands in what is today Oklahoma, Kansas, Indiana, and Ohio. Dr. Shriver serves as one of the primary directors of this ongoing research. In preparation of this 50th anniversary year, the Miami Tribe asked Cam to work together with Bobby Burke, Emeritus Director of the Center's Miami Tribe Relations Office, to author a definitive history of the relationship between the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and Miami University. It is our hope that we might all be able to enjoy that book within the next year. Tonight's presentation is largely derived from that research that Cam and Bobby have been doing for this upcoming publication. But Cam is much more than the sum of his collective historical research and writings. He is also a caring and generous teacher working with Miamia and non-Miamia students to help them to better understand our complex and overlapping past. Cam has also demonstrated that he's one of those rare individuals who is always ready to roll up his sleeves and pitch in no matter what needs to be done. A good example of this ethic is that Cam has worked to learn the calls and responses to stomp dance songs and has traveled between Ohio, Indiana, and Oklahoma in order to help the Miami tribe conduct dances that are so popular and important to our community. 
And aside from all of those, Cam is just a great presenter. And I think we're all in for a real treat tonight. So it's my pleasure once again to invite Dr. Shriver. I check it. Everyone's good to see you. Cam Shriver, Wenzuiani, Nila Mishe Malsa. My name is Cam Shriver. I'm an American. Nehe Nila Wapa Kalukia. I'm white. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. <coughs> This is a content forecast. I'm going to spend some time on race-based ideology, including nicknames and mascots tonight. In other talks and writing, including the Miyamiaki Conference, I've focused on the land endowment of Miami University uh, and the dispossession of the Miami nation. I've also focused on the last 50 years with Bobby Burke, certainly a story of increasing respect between the Miami tribe and Miami University. That's what we're here celebrating. Today I want to lead us as we consider the early 20th century. This was not a pleasant story, but it is a necessary background to consider where we were 50 years ago. Maybe, and my hope is that it helps us map out that road <clears throat> where we've been. As Miami diplomats would have said at one time, it feels now, now it feels like it's a white road. It's a good road. Peaceful, full, free of brambles. But once it was considerably more red than all that, a treacherous path. <coughs> Twisting and turning, but powerful nonetheless. You can think about red and white, and in this logo, black. If I say red, white, and black, in the context of this logo, some of you know what that means. And there's more information on the t I'm told to uh, go to the table in the back and, and read the, uh, the stuff that uh, Andy and, and Tina said out there, and Stella. Red and white. If you're an athletics fan at Miami University, maybe that evokes certain images. If you're an athletics fan in the early 20th century, it might have evoked different images. On September 16, 1885, the Miami siblings John and Esther Miller arrived at the barracks of Carlisle Industrial School. After a long railroad trip from Miami Indian Territory through St. Louis, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh. The next day, Miami University began a new era, now called the New Miami. The Miami University opened for classes that fall of 1885 after a dozen years of dormancy following the human and financial devastation of the American Civil War. And almost immediately, they began to build an athletic tradition. Miami University, like so many schools, has a long history of grappling with its changing brand. But more than that, Miami's athletic history formed an unlikely springboard for what we're celebrating now. Very unlikely indeed. <laughs> That's an educational relationship with the Miami tribe. Short story is that Miami students that is at this university in the early 1970s decided they wanted to change the nickname of their athletic teams. In response, President Shriver created a committee to investigate the issue. That committee then wrote to Chief Forrest Olds. And he showed up 50 years ago. As Benjamin Harrison, Miami class of 1852 said, this is him as a younger man, in his first annual message to Congress, Substantial progress has been made in the education of the children of school age and in the allotments of lands to adult Indians. He argued that school should be compulsory for Indian children and our legislation should be highly considerate of the best interests of an ignorant and helpless people. Miami graduates certainly put their mark on Indian country, but given the success of forced deportation, they had to leave Oxford to do that. There weren't any native students at Miami in this period. There were before and there have been since. But a letter written by Arizona Jackson, she goes by J uh, Zona, who's a Wyandotte woman from Indian Territory. 
She was attending school at Earlham College, just to the west in Richmond, Indiana. And I think she reveals common conceptions among non-natives in this area. Jackson had grown up near, and for all intents and purposes, could have been Miami or Ottawa or Shawnee. I mean, she's from Ottawa County, what is now Ottawa County. <laughs> she wrote to her friend from Richmond. I found that after I'd been here a day, whenever a student came, the first thing they saw was the Indian girl. Some of the girls came and asked me where she was. Seemed to be surprised when I told them that I was the Indian girl. That shows that they saw me different from what they expected. So many that know nothing of Indians can't think of them any other way, and being savages, uncivilized, and anything but the right thing. After college, Zona Jackson returned home, and she taught at the Miami Day School. She taught Miami kids, Miami kids. If a Native American had attended Miami Univers University at this time, would they have faced the same stereotypes? Do they still? Well, Miami Athletics began when the young Eastern faculty introduced it in 1888, helping McMicken University, which is now called the University of Cincinnati, organize a team. And they've played each other ever since. Miami, that year, recruited ringers from town, like a painter named Charlie Muston, who was bigger than any other Miami student, and a local pool room owner from uptown. They took the field against the Dayton Stillwaters in 1888, losing the match. And then in early December, they also played McMicken to a scoreless tie in Oxford. 0-0 zero, zero game, an auspicious start. It was a rainy, muddy affair. That's what they blamed it on. The average weight of Miami's team was 138 pounds. <laughs> Sophomore Roscoe Mason looks every inch an athlete in his new playing suit. One imagines the team then hopping onto their penny-farthing penny bicycles, donning their white bowlers, and pedaling the slant walk to discuss their lackluster effort at an uptown saloon. This is a real picture of Miami students. <laughs> they, they formed a bicycle club. Kind of. In June 1889, so right uh, after that, students and faculty officially formed the Miami University Athletic Club, and they chose colors, scarlet and white. I'm thinking about branding, and I wonder if Miami University could even use the word scarlet anymore, <laughs> considering the Ohio A&M in Columbus have branded the and scarlet and gray. Literally the word. The word the is in, our, is in the Miami University. A few years later, Ohio's college presidents formed a conference, and they mandated rules, such as players have to be enrolled students. Athletes could not receive compensation, and they even outlawed profanity and punching. <laughs> so football was just one of many... Uh, athletic groups on campus. Miami's philosophy was pretty typical. Physical activity developed the body, the mind, and the morals. By the 1910s, Miami President Raymond Hughes announced, I'm becoming more and more opposed to granting Phi Beta Kappa or Magna Cum Laude graduation to physically unfit students. Under George Ryder and Thomas Van Voorhees, intercollegiate athletics and physical edu education coalesced. So the school provided more intramural opportunities, including a course in coaching and physical education in 1924, and that's the second such cur curriculum in the country after the University of Illinois, the university that will pop up several times here. Nobody needed a nickname. The school developed teams in baseball, basketball, track, and ping pong. That's true. <laughs> All the writers just called them Miami. At the same time, Miami students at Carlisle and other places, they were active and enthusiastic athletes. Henry Froman competed for the Indians in baseball in the 1890s. In the 1910s, Edwin Miller was a star on the lacrosse field, a captain of the team that played schools like Princeton and Harvard. He was a captain in 1917. He moved around different boarding schools, from Carlisle Industrial School to other labor camps or schools, other indoctrination places at Chilocco, he was on the track and field team. He was at Carlisle as well, and he's pictured here, I think, holding the discus. At Miami University, name it, native imagery was beginning to appear, but in kind of unexpected ways. Here I want to turn attention to Alfred Upham, who, according to Bobby Burke, an authority, showed an early flair for ritual. I'm really relying on Bobby Burke's research and some of her interpretations here. More than anyone, Upham shaped university traditions in the early 20th century. 
Growing up on a farm just a county over from Oxford, he's up uh, from near Eton. He was Miami's valedictorian in 1897. Then he earned a literature PhD at Columbia. He joined Miami's faculty and he taught Latin, Greek, and English. For the school centennial in, 18 in 1909, he published a history of his alma mater and he called it Old Miami, the Yale of the Early West. <laughs> Upham that year standardized an alma mater song and initially it was a folk invention. It went by the popular tune of Oh My Darling Clementine. He wrote and rewrote several verse and chorus lyrics, and eventually the words solidified to celebrate Miami history. A man of many talents, Upham next took on a new role called Miami's Director of Publications in the 1910s. He was a booster of all things Miami. He engaged alumni by sending out a bulletin. He organized the first homecoming in 1914. And this first homecoming, it seems, was an opportunity for the first pageant of Miami history. Now we're going to get into it. Miamians reinforced a particular version of their institution's early history and creation. And across the country, similar institutions were developing parallel mythic beginnings, moments of creation. Ironically, they're attempting to explain their distinctiveness, and they're all kind of doing the same things. Pioneers, so the story went, overcame the wilderness or Indians, or usually a mix of both. That's the story, that's the narrative. Students in my class, we discussed this today. <laughs> a pageant of Miami history played on campus over many years in the 1910s. It continues into the 20s and indeed into the 30s. The pageant's prologue was described as an aboriginal background with a tribe of Miami Indians, then the first campus and its first inhabitants. This prologue was a lengthy poem and it was called The Sachem's Prophecy. It was written by a guy named George Carver and it began, hear ye warriors of Miami, hear me in the solemn council. The poem and the pageant's performance on campus had nothing to do with Miami people, but it had everything to do with non-native perceptions of Miami people. A war dance performed by Miami students was, after all, the prologue, so this happens before the university. The poem depicted a story of native disappearance, laying out a history of former people supplanted by the current residents of Oxford. Indians were people from history. Pioneers replaced them. Settlement was the beginning of the current epoch, meant for us today, not native people. And like so many poems and pageants and speeches on this topic, it delivered this ideology as a prophecy that flowed from the lips of a past Native American man. This is not a Native guy. Well, I don't know about this picture. The person saying the prologue is not a Native person. It's a person acting as a Native person, a settler. This is what he said. The beginning of the pageant. Now through the land of the Miami, mighty race of mighty warriors flows the steady stream of white men, rushing here and pooling there, striving for a land of freedom. Whence they came, they knew it now. Here they settle, sternly turning all our forests into towns. All our race will be forgotten, all our deeds unknown to song, all our lore lost to story, all our prowess dragged in dust. For huge cities, homes of white men, strange new customs manners grow in the land of the Miami. Toward the, rate, the sun, our race must bend. So, my brothers of Miami, let us onward our goal. Progress, culture, wealth, and service take our place upon this soil. And the name which long we've cherished shall be born in honor long here within the land of hunters by Miami's tower-topped halls. Then the pageant begins. So as the new Miami replaced an old Miami, so this pageant told its audience that the old Miami had replaced the still older Miami Indians, hunters and warriors who lived in a forest. Miami's tower-topped halls literally took our place upon this soil, said the Miami Indian character. And lastly, an unattributed quotation appears, simply stating, and so they called it Miami, which means in the Indian tongue, beautiful. It doesn't mean that. Students in the Shakespeare course taught by Professor Upham revised the pageant for several successive years. Here you can see stage directions. 
What happens is that natives are dancing, and again, these are not native people, okay? These are white folks playing Indian. Then settlers come onto the stage. This was staged, uh, I think, originally on the steps of Alumni Library, and then it got really big in the 1930s, so it was staged in, on the Miami football field. So natives are dancing, then settlers come. For some reason, Indians attack them for no reason until they slowly quiet down. Their war whoops are fade to nothing. Lights out, lights come back on, a bugle sounds and native people never appear again. <laughs> Exit stage left. Oxford's participation in, in, in inventing a romantic history based on progress, inevitably replacing the, quote, forgotten race, was hardly unique. So the pageant of Miami history debuted the same year as the pageant of Bloomington and Indiana University, a play in which female spirits, some of them are called like things like determination, courage, forced the Indians to abandon their violent attack on peaceful pioneers. But in both pageants, and a lot of pageants, historian James Buss describes across the region in this era, Poetic or performed or artistic histories in Ohio and Indiana and Illinois literally forced native characters to leave the stage to make way for white settlement. Why did native people leave? In these versions, federal policy, violent deportation, even land purchase is just absent. Instead, it's simply a kind of a natural law. You know, toward the sun, our race must bend, an invented, an invented Miami speaker says at Miami University. Jim Buss calls this a narrative of anti-conquest, in which Native folks become sad victims of the spirit of progress itself. In a version of history in which forces like destiny, providence, or nature require Indian exportation or extinction, there's no one to blame but the natural order of things. Nobody makes decisions. People, Native people just leave. They were doomed, maybe by their Indianness. This is a wider phenomenon. Middletown resident Frank Moore, Middletown is a, another city in Butler County, staged a play called Hiawatha throughout the Midwest and even took it to Amsterdam and London in this period. So this is based on a Longfellow poem. And Moore's adaptation, they both feature a fictional native person named Hiawatha, who's unrelated to the historical founder of the Haudenosaunee Iroquois Confederacy, so there was a real Hiawatha, this is not that story. Hiawatha meets a French missionary, he accepts him, and he politely paddles his canoe to the sunset, ending the narrative. So the region, the country is practically lousy with these pageants. Native communities disagreed on the value of these versions of history. So the Society of American Indians argued um, many in frustration as Arthur Parker says, we are the coming race, not the vanishing one. I mean, there are responses to this. He's, he's, he's chiding pageant officials in Colorado in 1915, so at this very time. Now, Miami families in Indiana held their own performances, primarily staged to make money from admissions. Miami pageants funded legal fees to fight illegal state property taxes, among other things. The Miami pageant troupe, the Makunsqua Company, presented a mixture of authentic Miami culture, some dances, some bead and ribbon work, uh, some governing councils, with markers, of non, uh, with markers that a non Miami audience who they're trying to attract would have seen as authentically native, when ironically it's not authentically Miami. Uh, you know, large headdresses, different types of paint, um, at the tiny teepee that you can see maybe in the background. This is all based on Wild West shows and other stage dramas. They even traveled locally. They performed at Greenville in Ohio. The McCunsquaw Company did. Quote Laura Siders, who is a highly respected elder, she remembered her youth in pageants. She said, if you're gonna sell tickets to a pageant, you've gotta put something in there that they're gonna expect. This is in the 1990s. She says, what are a few of us Indians gonna do? We've gotta scalp somebody. <laughs> At Miami, the slow transition from red and white, often scarlet and white, to an athletic nickname of Big Red seems unplanned. Nearly all Miami students were white, but they focused on the red part of the name. They never called themselves the Big Whites, for example. 
Miami was the big reds or the red and white. At the same time, Native people existed in nostalgia. In the Midwest, Native pe people existed before us, before pioneers. I never bothered to find Native perspectives, although they might have asked Addison Walker, a World War I veteran. They might have asked Addison Walker on the left. They might have asked Esther Dagenet. Esther, Esther Miller is who I began this talk with. She was a Carlisle survivor. Uh, she's here pictured in Columbus, Ohio. She comes as, the inaugural, as an inaugural member of the Society of American Indians. So she's pictured with her name uh, there. So she's from Miami, Oklahoma. She's a Miami citizen. Um, she's seated just in front of native icons, Henry Rowe Cloud and Charles Eastman. So she's in this circle of progressive intellectuals. Um, my students um, in other classes might recognize Henry Standing Bear, another Carl graduate sitting to her right, as well as on the end of this row, uh, I included Arthur Parker, who is the one who said, we're not a vanishing people, we're the coming race. Her husband is the short guy in the top row. I'm gonna come back to him. Very briefly. So native inspired imagery floated along the currents of daily life here. Flotsam periodically discovered in the ebb and flow of the university. Now in 1928, Alfred Upham was hired as the university's new president. His vision for the university included looking forward. Upham and his team had experience in boosterism. So uh, more than a decade earlier, he's an English professor at Bryn Mawr, but he writes to the president with ideas. Um, he says that Miami has to develop good talking points, including <laughs> individual attention, clean athletics, traditions, preparation afforded for various callings, new buildings, etc. Might sound familiar <laughs> today. Already growing in enrollment, the institution would embrace the modernizing content occurrence of higher education. So the administration's objectives including attracting, included attracting students, particularly middle and upper class, um, upper middle class students. This is a very crowded market, higher education market. As Charles Larrabee puts it, college is offered a way both to get a job and have a good time. This is a collegiate revolution. This is a new idea in the 1920s. Meaningful experiences would then make alumni remember their collegiate years fondly, and maybe they would give back to their institutions. So competing with schools on the field and in student recruitment required a distinguishing feature. What set Miami University apart? Perhaps it's age, but just because a school is old does not make it attractive. <laughs> Rather, by inventing and then invoking the idea of tradition and heritage, Miami could differentiate itself from its upstart competitors. They're particularly uh, angry at the University of Miami at this time period, who is stealing their reputation, and they suggest that they call themselves Everglades University. I mean, the presidents are like sniping at each other uh, in this time period. Stolen valor. Um, Upham was successful. Uh, he regaled an audience at All Miami Day with a sweep of a century and more from primitive timber lands and roving tribes of Indians through all the pioneering of a new frontier town. And I've read a typed copy of Upham's speech and it is moving. It was reported as a masterpiece of condensed history, tradition, and loyalty. Those things work together. This was exactly when Miami underwent an aesthetic transformation, indeed, the same year as Colonial Williamsburg. Miami's architect, Charles Solarius, who's later sometimes called Colonial Charlie, imposed a neo-Georgian red brick style on a formerly vernacular, sometimes neoclassical or federal, um, always utilitarian campus. So consider uh, the South Dorm, which is now called Stoddard Hall, pictured here. It goes through quite a change, adding porticos, uh, other architectural features that some architects might name. <laughs> um, <laughs> shutters, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, stuff. The refashion, refashioning of uh, Miami's Oxford campus supported a new Miami that highlighted an old tradition. The religious uniformity on Miami's campus reflects a 20, 20th century taste for colonial spaces. And then, the school plunged toward an athletic nickname. It was within weeks of the stock market crash of 1929. After a football game, President Upham, this is his second year as the school's leader, 
He visited the third floor meeting of the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity on High Street after a football game. Apparently that's something that presidents used to do. I don't know if they still do that. You go to a fraternity. Upham was a deacon himself, and knowing some of the fraternity members, he apparently wished a change away from Big Red. That's how it's reported. He wanted to change. He asked a student and football player named Frank S. Games for his thoughts. This is what Games said. Well, this, Indian, this is Indian country, and they've been part of the folklore. The Indian tribe and the rivers are all named Miami. I'm going to use a term uh, now as it's written for clarity's sake. Why not use the term Redskins as a designa designation for Miami athletics teams? Years later, this Frank Games corroborated the story. Uh, he also suggested at that time that Miami should hire a new football coach named Paul Brown, who was his old teammate, uh, who was coaching a high school in Massillon, Ohio. They didn't. So Games, the football player, suggested the nickname in 1929. Now this rings true because a couple years earlier, his high school in Coshocton, Ohio, had adopted the same nickname. In other words, while he's a high school student, the high school adopts that nickname. Then he brings it here. Coshocton, like Miami, the choosing of those names reflects the desire of white folks to establish a connection with the area's previous inhabitants, in addition to a sense of imperialist nostalgia in commemorating their defeat and honoring their absence. That's what his geographer Ezra Zeitler writes about Coshocton specifically. Maybe the same could be said of 93 high schools in Ohio that have adopted native nicknames. As of 2005, Ohio led all states in a number of high schools that used uh, the term Redskins for their high schools. Ohio's the leader in that. At Miami, oh, that's a note to myself. This uh, sculptor visits named Laredo Taft is really important, and it's all in the context. At Miami, He's a sculptor of like Native American men and other things. At Miami, the new name received support in the person of Ralph McGinnis. Named Mac, he had been on the football team in the 1910s. He enlisted and fought in Europe during the Great War, and then he studied romantic literature at the Sorbonne. He returned to Oxford beginning in 1920. He was the elected president of a new association called the M Association, which is an, an athletic booster group. It aimed for better student and alumni support of athletics. That's their mission as well as publicity to build a new gymnasium. Then he coached high school in Northwest Ohio, and then he sought to create a new job, which he called Publicity at Miami. In his role, McGinnis edited the alumni newsletter, and he was the faculty advisor for the student newspaper called the Miami Student. Miami took promotion to new heights. In the late 1920s, Mac, and thus Miami University was at the vanguard of a new field called advertising. This is also new. McGinnis wrote to President Upham that legitimate publicity is yet in its infancy. It's far from an exact science, but far removed from the ballyhoo which passes for it. McGinnis had indeed worked for the AP as a journalist, and so he was ready to develop stories for distribution for the public and alumni. So the president and the publicity director worked as a team to develop Miami's modern brand. McGinnis accepted the Miami job, and immediately he attended Pop Warner's football school in Wittenberg. Another connection here, Pop Warner invents the forward pass, makes his start as a football coach at Carlisle Indian School, <laughs> where he coaches Jim Thorpe, among other, th other people. He also, uh, Carlisle, the, there's, there is one Miami student at Carlisle, by the way, and his name is Willis Pakangi. I think he's on the JV team. <laughs> <laughs> he plays with Jim Thorpe, though or he's on the JV team with Jim Thorpe, <laughs> Willis Pakangi. So McGinnis saw football as a linchpin to his institution's brand. He was filled to the brim with ideas, he says. The pieces were basically in place. There's a president intent on distinguishing his school, a publicity man, and a new nickname. So by 1930, McGinnis made a pronouncement. Henceforth and hereafter, the term Big Reds is to have new meaning. Since the state is overrun with bearcats, wildcats, bobcats, musketeers, and other such like small deer, members of the athletic department went into a huddle not long ago. They decided that Miami teams ought to have a new moniker and a new symbol. As the very name of Miami is taken from an Indian tribe, and the term Big Reds smeaks of smacks of redskins on the warpath, an Indian brave in warlock and feathers was thought a suitable insignia. This article was distributed by mail to the school's alumni and it introduced the logo. It was a silhouette profile of a man, 
And it said, in this brave scalp lock are two feathers indicating that the two enemies had been slain. The tuft of hair just behind the forehead indicates the brave has been officially made a warrior. Some kind of made up uh, ideas. The transition really gained momentum. This is McGinnis using it in his news bureau kind of header. Some really, uh, see, the point of this is to show that the insignia is put onto cheerleaders' outfits, but I also like how fabulous these guys are. <laughs> It's like problematic, but also, uh, come on, like, I like, th <laughs> these guys are fun. So Miami University followed in the steps of this high school in Northeast Ohio and for similar reasons. Rather than a name generated at the founding, the Redskins idea was a new trendy moniker that linked athletes to the supposed, vi supposed violence <laughs> of long gone American Indians. Many universities generated a faux native identity in the 1920s and 30s, along with Miami. They played Indian because of stereotypes. You know, native people as hunters, Indian men as anti-modern, indigenous culture as violent. Dozens of colleges, in addition to high schools, adopted native mascots at this time. You know, one example that Miami is looking to is the University of Illinois. They use native stereotypes as a fundraising strategy for a new stadium in 1921. The stadium, a pamphlet advertised, would become a symbol of a new, united, fighting, aspiring tribe of Ill Illini. Inventing a new tribe called Illi Illini ignored the existing nation, which is called the Peoria Tribe of Oklahoma. That's like Illinois people become the Peoria Tribe of Oklahoma. They exist. They're in Oklahoma. In 1921, the most important and well-known Illini is Charles Dagenet, married, married to Esther Dagenet. They've divorced by 1921, um, but he is uh, wearing three-piece wool suits. <laughs> He's negotiating jobs for American Indians and in industries such as automobile manufacturing in Detroit. He's working out of Washington, D.C. Likewise, uh, Stanford transitions from red to Indians in the 1930s. They give the ex exact same narrative that Indians kill animals is why Stanford changes or adopts uh, Indians. Syracuse, Utah, North Dakota, Dartmouth. While the Miami girl named Mildred Walker, she was scraping weevils from her food at Seneca boarding school. Federal government reported abysmal healthcare, economic and educational conditions nationwide among native communities and families. But uh, these colleges were focused on feathers. The Miami nickname uh, was successful for Miami University. It apparently stoked school spirit, it unified people into a common identity at Miami University. They made conscious decisions to rally around this name for atmosphere, for boosterism. And the brass band was a key pillar of this, again an invention. The Miami student, again under the uh, advice of Ralph McGinnis, um, made a plea in 1930, the same year, for a varsity marching band. He said, there's, uh, the student said, I should say, there's something intangible about a well-trained and well-drilled brass band which always warms the hearts of its auditors, adding that a well-trained varsity band can become another great pu publicity agent for the university. Wearing scarlet and red, uh, scarlet and white, I should say, the new band began practicing. Next, the band bought two Indian costumes to be used to feature Indian tradition and a new Miami song. Within a month, not only was the band using a tom-tom in its performances, but it had a new piece to play. It was called the Miami Scalp, uh, the, the, yeah, Miami Scalp Song. The Miami Scalp Song, like other invented traditions, emerged from a mixture of social context and a desire to redefine community identity. People were using creative license to fashion what they thought would be popular. The lyrics had been developed earlier, uh, but this is applying new music to it. Now, the intramural sports director, Thomas Van Voorhees, he led a gathering on an October Thursday evening in Oxford about Indian traditions at Miami. Voorhees was a pioneer in college intramurals, but not really a student of Indian country. The program was intended, as they said, to further the Indian tradition at Miami. It remains unclear whether, uh, when these men said Indian traditions or Indian lore, they meant in information about Native people, or material about Indian stereotypes, or about play acting, and maybe the difference between stereotype and reality was indeed difficult for them to find. At this assembly about Indian lore in 1937, the band came up, and they performed their new piece, an upbeat, brassy march. 
The Glee Club director, a guy named Raymond Burke, said that the idea of a scalp song was Holy Dr. Upham's. He wanted a song for the Redskins dance between the halves of the football field. This is his wife, Daisy, who apparently wrote, actually composed the music. Two junior boys danced to what was reported as a war dance, which is, it was not a war dance, in their new costumes. The Miami scalp song used a cliche ethnic sound that all of you have heard. That's not a native sound, a made up one. And it goes like this. Bum, 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 bum. That sound was made up by Carl King, a band composer from Northeast Ohio, who invented it to emphasize native violence in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. It was already adopted for a mascot performance at the University of Illinois. So it's not a native idea, that cadence. It was invented tradition of music for white folks. So the university was expanding its stereotype aesthetic. It drew from a couple of playbooks. First, it was in line with histor historical trends in higher education. Miami participated in what is called the Collegiate Revolution. They began touting their pretty quadrangles, their athletic spirit, and their alumni entering managerial professions. Miami was fighting to attract students in this crowded marketplace. It was advertising itself and its faux native mascot as a brand to increase that effort. Second, Miami was following aspirational institutions in line with historical trends. In addition, many of these key players had a background in the Boy Scouts. The composer of the Scalp Song, as well as Miami's Fight Song, a guy named Rabin Burke, was a former Boy Scout and remained active in the organization. So too did Miami's president, Alfred Upham. The Boy Scouts of the early 20th century was an organization intended to promote patriotic masculinity among American boys. And in this, it was a perfect complement to college football ideology. So the guy, Lesser Lutweiler, who plays Chief Alinawick, at the University of Illinois, the first one, he learned about Indians through his Boy Scout participation in Denmark. <laughs> then he constructed his costume while camping as a Boy Scout in Colorado. According to historian Phil Deloria, the co-founders of the Boy Scouts attached great importance to play acting and costuming. They saw Indians and pioneers not simply as historical role models, but as points of entry into magically transfiguring mimetic play for children. It was important for Boy Scouts to play Indian, despite their ethnicity or citizenship. Going all the way back to the Boston Tea Party, when rebels had play-acted as Mohawks, settlers have used images of Native Americans to call themselves the rightful owners of American territory. The Miami University marching band, with its two feathered Indians, was a perfect blend of Boy Scout co-founder Dan Beard's interest in military-style nationalism and fellow co-founder Ernest Thompson Seton's vision of primitive, anti-modern humanism represented by what he called the red man. So creating Miami traditions from this ideological mixture, men like Upham Burke and McGinnis found quite a bit of success. Same year, 1937, the alumni newsletter announced a more textured image created by an art student. The young buck on the cover is the new Miami Redskin. They encouraged alumni to buy decals of the new image, saying, it represents exhaustive research into the history as well as the racial characteristic of the red man who stalked the deer and pioneer over the hills of Oxford. I wrote shrug there. The Miami Indian was the best type of noble savage. Oh, great. Good. In the week or so leading up to this talk, I was in conversation with Leah LeVar Wagner in the libraries, um, and then some folks helping me interpret this, including Steve Gordon and Adela, uh, Delaria. Uh, there was a mural commissioned by the Public Works Administration that actually hung in the alumni library. It was painted by Matthias Noheimer in 1934. I realize it's uh, difficult to see with the size of the screen if you're in the back. I'll, I'll try to pull up uh, some zoom. We haven't yet found a color image, but this is from newspaper coverage, and it's odd. I mean, as the student newspaper explained, it combined four scenes of Miami's founding era. The artist's primary research was Upham's old history book. What's important uh, that I'm quoting here is that these are the four scenes. Sims negotiating for the famous land purchase, conquest of the state, the last stand of the red men as they were being driven out, and then early settlers invading the wilderness, which is an odd thing to invade. 
I'm not sure what to make of all that. They, they called them red men and not red skins, and I wonder if that's significant, that how can, how can we invade us? Upham had different ideas about what Miami meant, and they kind of changed. I found in Noheimer's letters, thanks to Aaliyah, uh, the idea that the derivation of the name Miami was actually from mother. Uh, that's not what it means. <laughs> sure enough, in Upham's history book, in a chapter about Greek life, he suggests as much. And this helps explain some of the oddities we see. Here is what he called Mother Miami. And so he called this mural a derivation of the name Miami. It meant mother. Therefore, this is Mother Miami. An indigenous woman, uh, allegorical figure reaching down to other native people, which itself is, is a bit unique in this genre of allegorical things. It's totally normal to see allegorical depictions of settlers overtaking Native Americans and the wilderness. And in most cases I can think of the figure of mother or Columbia as a woman. And typically the violence itself is absent. The progress of civilization is just ordained and bloodless. But in Noheimer's depiction, Mother Miami is a Miami woman. Native men are reaching to her. I wonder if this is a moment, however brief, of an artist depicting settler violence provided for that settler community who had adopted a native persona. It's a weird mix. In any case, perhaps it's no uh, coincidence that it only lasted two years, 1934 to 36. Thanks to Annie and Olia and others for helping me with that. More to, more to find out. Well, trading in this type of rhetoric and imagery, Miami's campus was almost certainly more hostile to indigenous Americans than a century before. Floodgates were open. Uh, struggled with what, uh, as the floodgates really open, uh, is this becoming gratuitous? Um, literally in this presentation. I'm gonna leave the history more or less there, except to note that this was getting more stereotypical, not less. Pseudo-native vernacular saturated Oxford. Matriculation climbed steadily from just about 2,000 students before the Second World War to about 15,000 students in the 1960s. The dining hall became the reservation. The Alumni Association, starting in 1950, began selling a cartoon. Well, this cartoon. A character named Hiawaba emerged in a campus humor magazine, which was called the Tomahawk, and made the jump into university branding. Then it became the, kind of a, an official uh, image of the university. You can see it on the drum there. This is different, it's kind of constantly changing. It's getting, yeah, it's changing. It also becomes the name of um, the dancing mascot, becomes called Hiawaba. This is Jim Cooley, who becomes a state, uh, state representative, um, and he's the one who calls and writes to Chief Forrest Olds, this guy. Curtis Ellison is here, and I have a quote from Kurt Ellison. <laughs> He's the American Studies professor, and he came to Miami in 1970 from the University of Minnesota. That's a place where uh, American Indian activism was at its height, and not so in Oxford. This is him, and I can't do his accent, I wish I could. I walked into Miami University Center, this building. That's where, th that's where this is. And there was a snack bar called the Redskin Reservation. I couldn't believe it. I said, have I stepped back in time 30 years? Where am I? That's in a video, actually. As networks of Native Americans developed active and sometimes radical responses to their long dispossession and colonialism, Miami University could hardly have found itself in a worse position relative to actual Native people. I mean, these are responses not, not from today, but from the 1960s. and one from today in Chicago, in Chicago. 
The deportation of native people from the region had now been followed by a cartoon version. On campus, as across much of America, non-native imaginations concocted stereotypes, replacements for real humans. Then the elected leader of the Miami nation appeared 50 years ago. It's hard to draw many optimistic um, conclusions, except I would remind us that we're, I guess, celebrating 50 years of more positive relationships. I think it's important to maybe um, discuss this a bit, and may not all the time, but so every once in a while, and so that's been my, my hope and effort. There's been an understandable backlash against the Indian head logo created by John Ruthven in the context of native play acting, particularly in the 2000s. Yet, so many Oxford families hold the Ruthven portraits as important. I reconcile this. In the 1970s, the Ruthven portraits were better than what had come before. They were more human. They were touted as more accurate. That was what they said, the university, to alumni. And they had the blessing of the Miami chief. In other words, the Miami Indian head logo, this is problematic, and I'm, I'm willing to take pushback on this. You could consider it, one might consider it as a kind of first Miami heritage logo. As communities, many of us have moved on from feathers, but I think those changes are sometimes difficult for people to see, and I hope this longer context um, you know, helped us think about the 70s and beyond. Nineteen seventy-two, fifty-year relationship. Chief Folds came to campus. Well, that's the human face-to-face -face relationship. We might think of the relationship going back farther. It's rooted in colonialism and land expropriation and deportation. Indeed, the relationship between the Miami Nation and Miami University could only be considered a negative one in 1971. I hope that talking about this history helps us imagine where we were, the significance of what we've done, the path still before us, and the weight of what we're continuing to do. Thank you. Question? Do my best. That suit that suits me. Yeah, yeah. A uh, question about the murals done at the Houston Woods Lodge. That's not something that I know much about. I'll bet people in the audience know a lot about it. The question was what it does in the, was it done in the 50s? Um, oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the murals at the Houston Woods Lodge, but I w will try to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. There are these native-inspired, uh, native-inspired mu big murals at Houston Woods Lodge. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Question about repatriation. I think that's uh, good. And the con and the question. Um, so repatriation of, let's say, ancestors, um, what are called human remains, or uh, items of cultural patrimony from federally funded museums and organizations back to Native American nations, which is really uh, was uh, intended to begin with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. Uh, and continues um, with some organizations dragging their feet or not, uh, for different reasons. Um, uh, many organizations are not yet in uh, compliance with that 1990 federal law. And um, I think the work continues apace, and I know that in the, 
uh, I will say my sense is that in the Miami Nation, that is the work of many people, many people, full-time job. So it continues within the, within the Miami Nation, which has its um, contacts around the United States, and although it's outside of that law, around the world, indeed, there are ancestors all, all over the place. Mm -hmm. It continues, uh, it continues. Thanks. Maybe time for one more as I see some food entering the room. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan. That's a great question. I, uh, my sense is that other teachers, other teachers in the room or other people who deal with undergraduates might have a better sense, uh, including Karen, Bobby. Um, but uh, my sense is that a lot of students um, do know about it. Uh, I don't know where they get it from, but a lot of students are also second or third generation Miami people um, who know that it changed and know that it maybe should have changed, but don't understand the where's and the why's. Uh, of that story, and that's something we've talked quite a bit about, of why did it change, why did it change in 1996, and maybe that's a discussion for a different day, except I would say that um, it seems that a lot of my students, at least in history classes, are, are pretty socially conscious in thinking about um, allyship between all kinds of institutions and all kinds of minoritized communities, um, and it continues to be a topic that we discuss in Native American history classes because other schools and teams continue to hold on to that and also change. And so it's, it's a constant news story, actually, and it kind of sucks up a lot of the news cycle in even like Indian country news is about mascots and nicknames, not about Native people. Um, so my sense is that a large contingent of our undergraduates know that it used to be that name, uh, but a, a lot of them al also don't. Yeah, I don't know if it's 50-50 or something like that. That's kind of my sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And even they were not, you know, they were they were extra fit. Mm -hmm. You know, but even they were not not mm -hmm. wanting to. You know, we had a discussion about mm -hmm. it. And it was a positive discussion. So mm -hmm. that was good. Mm -hmm. Tribal, uh, some of the business committee are saying they've had positive relations with Miami University community. Yeah, just uh, saying it out loud for people in the back. Yeah, one more, sure. Can I break the news? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Miamia, Miamia, yeah, 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 Miamia. Uh, which I, I said what it doesn't mean, but it means downstream person. Uh, if you're kind of an old name of downstream person, so it's not mother or beautiful or any of those things. Has the university, uh, not to my knowledge, and we have some of the important people here sitting in the front, I have not heard any rumblings of Miami University changing its name. Uh, Miami University is, is named, um, t in my understanding, um, the best I can tell, after the uh, Miami region, the Miami country. So the Sims Purchase was also called the Miami country or the Miami Purchase, named after the rivers, which are named because they lead to the Miami people. So river names lead to people. Um, so the Maumee in northern Ohio leads to the Miamis, and that river is called the Maumee by the Ottawa's like a different native tribe because it leads to the, the Miamis. Um, so it's the Miami country, and that's the Miami University in the Miami country. 
um, is where the name comes from, just a, a little background. But Miamia, people would have to learn how to say it then, I guess. <laughs> he, Yeah. Miamia, Miamia. Well, yeah, Miamia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Chris. Miamia, yeah. That's a question I can answer. Miamia Mission Nipwayone? Miamia Mission Nipwayone Nipwayone Kane? Miamia Mission Nipwayone Kane? Mission Nipwayone Kane? Miamia Mission Nipwayone Kane? Sorry. Miamia Mission Nipwayone Kane? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We would definitely get pushback from marketing on that thing. Mission A, Wanika. Thank you. Well, um, we've got some more d'oeuvres. I encourage you to stay, mix and mingle. There's lots of folks here that are visiting from out of state, uh, from the Miami tribe, Miamia students, Miamia center staff. So feel free to mix and mingle. So Mission Anyway, thank you, Dr. Shriver. Thank you.